you. That's sweet. Test. The Lord be with you. Welcome to worship on this beautiful day in the most beautiful sanctuary in Lawrence, Kansas. Also, a warm welcome to those worshiping at home via live stream, and then, of course, later at 11 o'clock on the KLWN radio broadcast. We encourage everyone sitting toward the center aisle to please sign our worship pads. 
passing to the side and then back to the center again. If you're interested in more information on Trinity, uh, please note that on the pad, if you, uh, if you will. We have a great list of upcoming forum speakers this morning. Uh, Catherine Dinsdale, a longtime family Promise Board member, will speak of some of the new developments within that organization, and I've asked Deb Boatwright to speak on Family Promise as well. But that forum will be right after this worship service in the Fellowship Hall. Good morning. Good morning. Following worship today, the Adult Forum will feature a presentation on Family Promise by Catherine Dinsdale, a founding board member of this important community ministry. As you know, Trinity is an active partner in this ministry and has been since its founding in 2008. Catherine will share her Family Promise story and talk about some important changes taking place this fall. She will also discuss ways in which Trinity, as well as each of us, can participate and support their mission, empowering families in a housing crisis to achieve stabilization through community connections. Please join Catherine and me in the Fellowship Hall as we learn how Family Promise is adapting to new opportunities and what that can mean for us. I hope to see you there. Thank you. One of the uh, extensive things that we did before the Capitol Appeal is we did an extensive survey in the congregation. I think we had roughly uh, 80 interviews that Joe Crowther conducted in one of the primary, in fact, the, the number one thing that you all said to Joe Crowther is we want our congregation to make an impact in the community. And your attendance at this forum that follows is one opportunity uh, that you um, have. Uh, there's no obligation, um, but it's, uh, it would be very, very helpful for you to learn more about Family Promise. Uh, next week, you have a choice between Pastor Randy's Bible study in the social room uh, or an informational session on a Stephen ministry. Uh, Kathy Box and Brenda Albright have completed or nearly completed extensive leadership training and uh, there's a new class in the works for this fall, so there's more information will be shared uh, next week. And for the first time ever uh, in my lifetime, I have some allergies. So um, if I start coughing uh, during um, the sermon, uh, just enjoy my discomfort uh, or scroll through your emails and I'll have some lozenges and water, take a break and we'll get through it together. Uh, it would be helpful to me, though, if you just averted your eyes, you know, if you didn't just sort of look at me um, while I'm coughing through. Uh, I'll, I'll recover, I promise. If you would, please stand for the confession and forgiveness. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known and from whom no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly, perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and one another. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown. Things we have done and things we have failed to do. And uphold us by your spirit, so that we may live and serve you in newness of through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together in Christ. By grace you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen us with power through the Holy Spirit that Christ may live in our hearts through faith. Amen.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Holy and righteous God, you are the author of life, and you adopt us to be your children. Fill us with your words of life, that we may live as witnesses to the resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated for the readings. <coughs> First reading is a reading from Acts. After healing a man unable to walk, Peter addressed the people, you Israelites, why do you wonder at this or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety we had made him walk? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our ancestors has glorified his servant Jesus whom you handed over and rejected in the presence of Pilate, though he had decided to release him. But you rejected the Holy and Righteous One and asked to have a murderer given to you. And you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses, and by faith in his name, his name itself has made this man strong, whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given him this perfect health in the presence of all of you. And now, friends, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers. In this way, God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, that this Messiah would suffer. Repent, therefore, 
and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. The word of the Lord. The second reading is from 1 John. See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this. When he is revealed, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. And all who have this hope in him purify themselves, just as he is pure. Everyone who commits sin is guilty of lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he is revealed to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Everyone who does what is righteous, just as he is righteous. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> Gospel according to St. Luke. Glory to you, Lord. Jesus himself stood among the disciples and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, Why are you frightened and why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is myself 
Touch me and see, for a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While in their joy they were disbelieving and still wondering, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate in their presence. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated, and while the children that are gathered, please come forward for the children's message. And in light of tomorrow, Monday, being American Sign Language ASL Day, we have printed our prayer, God loves me, Jesus is my friend, and church is a good place to be, great place to be, in your bulletin. But all children, please come forward for the children's message. Come on down and sit down. I'm going to teach you a few words first. Peace be with you. So the way you do peace, follow me real close. Over here, look at me. Put your hands together, smash it together, and spread the peace. With you and as i would say in the south all of y'all <laughs> now jesus said peace be with you to the disciples and they were confused and full of doubt but jesus showed his hands and his feet and even ate broiled fish to prove that he was real and not a ghost. Watch me now. Jesus opened their minds to understand the scriptures that he had spoke while he was with them. Now I'm going to read what he said. Everything written about me from Moses, the prophets, and Psalms must be fulfilled. Done. Thus it is written that the Messiah was to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. And that repentance and forgiveness of sins was to proclaim his name to all nations beginning in Jerusalem. And you're all witnesses to it. Now this is where this comes in watching this is called taking faith home and it said at the very top Jesus resurrection brings peace and forgiveness so let's say <coughs> all right all of y'all all you old kids out there do peace put your hands together smash it together and spread the peace and forgiveness yes Okay, let's say our prayer. All right, you little ones, show the older folks how to do this. So let's do it with me. God loves me. Jesus is my friend. Church is a great place to be. Amen. Y'all go back home. You older kids, be sure to study this now. Thank you. But, but Sonny, can you, can you teach us to sign all y'all? Yes. All, yes. all y'all. All you all. <laughs> that makes perfect sense to me. That's the one I'll get.
Jesus himself stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Luke records that Jesus showed everyone, not just Thomas, the wounds in his hands, the wounds in his feet. Jesus doesn't seem overly interested in their joy and their disbelieving because Jesus asks, what do you got to eat? And they give him a piece of broiled fish. Now the specificity, the detail of that should add to the veracity of the story. As someone who came of age in the last century and and used to, give, used to give sacramental status to openness. This homily is a response to a culture that seems hostile to the substance of the Christian faith and yet seems to give a free pass to the belief systems of all sorts of faiths, majoring in speculation and opinion, but minoring in specifics. Now, the late senator from New York, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, his quote fits. Everyone is entitled to their own opinion, but no one is entitled to their own facts. Who knows how he would respond to the phrase, alternative facts. So this is my annual cranky apologetics message. Now apologetics does not mean I am sorry for, but rather it's an explanation of. Because you see, our faith stands or falls on the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John they record different details about the crucifixion and the resurrection. But having something different to say can add credibility to the same event. Now, trust might be a bit better of a word than belief to describe what lies at the heart of faith. Because faith has more to do with a relationship than an explanation. And yet in order for me to, to get to trust you, especially if it means influencing the way I live, you're going to have to give me something more than your personal opinions. Now, if you're selected for a jury, you're asked to have no preconceptions. You're expected to be open-minded, drawing conclusions based not on speculation. You're expected, you, you're, you're, you, you consider the credibility of the witnesses, and you, you're to sift through the testimony. Now, a verdict does not mean 100% certainty. The legal standard is a preponderance of the evidence, or more likely than not, generally understood to mean in a civil jury, you're more than 50% sure. Now, one critique of Christianity is in the reliability of the Gospels. Now, the argument goes is that the Gospels, they are questionable because the earliest versions of the Gospels were written about 70 years after Jesus' death, and each writer has their own perspective, each writer has their own agenda. Well... It was an oral culture. There were no ravens. There were no libraries. There was no Amazon. It was an oral culture. Not many could read and far fewer could write. And the two earliest biographies of Alexander the Great were written hundreds of years after his death. And historians considered those bi biographies to be reliable. So what's fair is fair. And further, before the resurrection, the twelve, 
They were a constant source of disappointment to Jesus. They get in the way of children. Jesus tells about his coming suffering and death, and, and they argue about who can have the best seats in the coming kingdom. Jesus asks them to stay awake, and they fall asleep. Peter denies knowing Jesus. But after encountering the resurrected Christ, all of them are willing to be martyred. If you're a cynic, if you're an agnostic, what do you do with that? Since there are many witnesses and sources and details, there's bound to be some misunderstandings than if there had only been one writer. But much is made of the differences in the accounts. And yet having multiple accounts rather than one provides balance. Better to have multiple witnesses. Now, both Luke and John's account of the resurrected Christ show similarities. They describe Jesus appearing in Jerusalem. They describe the fear. Paul's understanding of the resurrection is in the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians. He's once a persecutor of Christians. Now he's older and in a pain that he never describes. He reminds them that Jesus was buried, raised on the third day. Then he appeared to Cephas and the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 people who were still alive. Then to James and the apostles. Finally he appeared to someone as unfit as me. And then Paul provides details and 500 or so other people if the folks at Corinth wanted to check out the story with corroborating witnesses. We get a taste of St. Peter's understanding of the resurrection in the first reading that Kevin read. The context is that Peter has just healed someone and the crowds that are clinging to Peter, the crowds are running to Solomon's portico in an astonishment and then Luke records Peter's sermon. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of our ancestors has glorified his servant Jesus, whom you handed over and rejected in the presence of Pilate, though he had decided to release him. But you rejected the Holy and Righteous One and asked to have a murderer given to you, and you killed the author of life whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. And now, friends, I know that you acted in ignorance, as you did also your rulers. Repent, therefore, and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. Peter has gone through a bit of a change. What do you do with that? In the case of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they differ a bit on who's at the empty tomb. Mark writes that it was Mary Magdalene, Mary, mother of James and Salome. Matthew says it was just Mary Magdalene and the other Mary. Luke writes it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, another Mary, James, and another woman. John says it was Mary Magdalene, and then they got Peter and John. Many years ago, a Harvard law prof and the author of an old treatise on what constitute evidence offered this evaluation after studying all four gospel writers. There is enough of a discrepancy to show that there could have been no previous concert among them. And at the same time, such substantial agreement as to show that they were all independent writers of the same event. If the writers had been much more consistent, that would invalidate them as independent witnesses. If this had been the case, there would likely be just one witness that the other three were parroting. Several years ago, I simplistically compared the way the different perspectives and personalities of Matthew and Mark and Luke and John approached writing their gospel to say if, if all of us, or even if 25 of us, went to, went to see a Chiefs and Las Vegas Raiders game, and then we all wrote an account of that game. 
It's likely if we all wrote an account of that game, everyone would include the score. Except maybe Candace. Most of us would include something about the poetic play of Patrick Mahomes. Now there's one Las Vegas Raiders fan here. He would probably include that Patrick Mahomes was too protected by the refs and his quarterback didn't get the same calls. (laughs) Someone would mention the absence or the presence of Taylor Swift. Candace might not even include the score since football is violent, causes brain injuries, and and causes dementia. We've not watched a Super Bowl game with anybody in 10 years. And if you wanted to read very different stories of the same game, contrast the coverage in the Kansas City paper with the Las Vegas paper. Same game different coverage because there are different readers. And some of us may look over our shoulder at what someone else wrote to remind us of a particular play. Read and study all of the stories if you want to know what happened. That's if we wanted to know what happened. And over time, probably three or four stories would come into common usage, and that would be the canon. Now, as I just shared this, I need to confess that for the last minute, I have had the late Professor Roy Harrisville of Luther Seminary screaming inside my head saying, Jeffrey, what you summarized in 60 seconds took me a full semester of how the Bible came to be. But an African scholar thoughtfully asked this question. And I like this question. Why did Jesus keep the scars from the cross? Jesus could have any resurrected body he want, but he chose one with identifiable scars that could be seen and could be touched. Why do you think Jesus kept the scars? She said, scars don't hurt anymore, but scars are memories. Maybe Easter, she concludes, maybe the resurrection would be incomplete without those scars. In the scars on Jesus' hands and feet and side, she said there is a preponderance of reasons for hope and faith. Because of those scars, we can have faith that the tears we shed are caused, the blows we receive are land, the losses we bear are cause, the mistakes we make, the emotional pain, the heartache over lost loved ones and friends. All these will become memories, memories, like Jesus' scars. Now, scars, be they internal or external, rarely go away. You can cover them up, but they're always there. But neither do scars hurt anymore. And the reason the season of Easter means the wounds and burdens of our lives need not hurt anymore either. Because Easter means one day we'll have new bodies, new minds, new spirits, and even new memories. And that's why faith matters and in whom we confess our faith. Please stand for the hymn of the morning.
Our service continues with the Apostles' Creed found either in your bulletins or in your hymnals on page 105. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Rejoicing that Jesus is risen and love has triumphed over fear, let us pray for the church, the world, and all those in need of good news. We pray for peace everywhere between Iran and Israel, Russia and Ukraine, in Gaza, and everywhere in the world where violence reigns. We pray Micah's prophecy is fulfilled in our day, that nations will disarm and beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks, that no nation will not lift up sword against another nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. God of grace, hear our prayer. You bring forth all life on earth, calm storms, bring water to parched places, and protect the climate that this planet would sustain life in all its variety. God of grace, hear our prayer. You offer wisdom and guidance beyond human knowledge. Instruct lawmakers, judges, and elected officials to make decisions grounded in your justice and care for all people. God of grace, hear our prayer. You bring all people together in you. Help us to remember our identity and purpose in our ministry. Move us to love our neighbors as ourselves and to share in beloved community. God of grace, hear our prayer. And into your hands, most merciful God, we command for all for whom we pray, <coughs> trusting in your abiding love, through Jesus Christ, our resurrected and living Lord. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. Please share the peace of Christ with your neighbor. Be seated for the anthem and the offering.
us pray. You call us to believe and bear fruit. May the gifts that we offer here be signs of your abiding love. Form us to be your witnesses in the world. Through Jesus Christ, our true vine. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our, the glorious resurrection of our Savior, Jesus Christ, the true Paschal Lamb who gave himself to take away our sin, who in dying has destroyed death and in his rising has brought us to eternal life. And so with Mary Magdalene and Peter and all the witnesses of the resurrection, with earth and sea and all their creatures, with angels and archangels, cherubim and seraphim, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial. Deliver us from evil. The kingdom, power, brought the elements in with you, you may commune at this time with these words, the body of Christ given for you, the blood of Christ shed for you. If you'd like to come forward to commune by intinction, simply place your open hand before the assisting minister, and then once you've received the wafer, you may dip it into the chalice. We also have gluten-free elements either on the back at the usher's table or here uh, if you'd like gluten-free elements, either go to the usher's table or ask me, and they'll be provided to you. We practice open communion here. You are welcome to receive the sacrament of Holy Communion. Please come.
we stand. May the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you with grace and with mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen.